Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. Well, good morning, Kingdom family and pod listeners. Good to great had the praise band back. Amen. We missed you guys last week. Uh, we're continuing in this fall series called Finding God in Popular Culture. And today we're uh, dealing with the 70s, and uh, the title of our message is Jesus Freaks. Am I a Jesus Freak? That's, that's the title of our message. Said, Does anybody recognize the song in the bumper video? You may, Jane, a few of you remember it. That was from a rock opera back in the 70s called Godspell. It was a huge movement that went on back in those days, and we'll spend some time talking about that. Godspell is about the formation of a community which carries on Jesus' teachings after he's gone. And, and in other words, it's the effect that Jesus has on others, which is what the whole story and shows about. And you kind of seen that when they're talking about day by day, we're just trying to live the love of Christ. And you see him exchanging and doing things for each other in that little clip that we watched. So it's a, it's a powerful message and it's a powerful time. And so we've been, as we've done this, if you missed a few weeks of this, we, we started this whole culture thing um, talking about the shift that really happened in America after World War II what happened to society and how we just, we really, there was a huge shift that took place with, and we use words like postmodernism and relativism, things like that, that came out of that movement and really put us where we are today as kingdom people in the world that we live in. So if you really understand this flow, especially from World War II to now, it helps you, I think, make sense of the world that we live in, but also I think gives you a lot of strength and tools to be a kingdom person and to dialogue with the culture that we live in today. I think it gives you a lot of weapons when you're out there trying to be uh, you know, live out this Christian life. I want to play a game for a minute. I'm going to play Let's Pretend, and we'll just say let's pretend that you're at Walmart. That's a store that everybody knows. You're at Walmart, and while you're there, there just happens to be a news team there, and this news team happens to pick you out because you got on your Christian attire. You got on, you know, Transformation UMC, or you got some scripture on the back of your jacket or whatever, and they walk up to you, and they said, hey, and they stop you, and they ask you a question. Are you a Jesus freak? That's the question they ask you. Yeah. They get, yeah, Jane says yes. God bless her. But that's, you're going to be on the news at Channel 5. You know, at 5 o'clock, you're going to be on the news with that question. So you could respond with a question, what do you mean by Jesus freak? Or you could cut and run. I mean, you could play, you know, pretend you didn't see him and, or you're deaf and just keep on walking. Or you could do like Jane says, yes, I'm a Jesus freak. But I'm asking you personally to internalize that. You know, how would you respond to that? Now, I'll let you wrestle with that question for a little bit. I promise I'm not going to ask everybody for a show of hands or put anybody on the spot, at least not yet. But, but I want to unpack this term Jesus freak because it's in this movement in the 70s. Some of you lived through it myself. This was a high time for me. But it's just at this time that really sets the stage for what's going to, where we're at today. What you've seen happen here this morning with this music, this praise band, this all came out of this movement. This is where this movement came. And so it's, I think it's really important to understand that as we go through that. What is, what are, who were the Jesus freaks and what was the Jesus movement about anyway? And the Jesus freak was a term used to describe non-traditional Christians of the Jesus movement. So if you were really in a traditional form of religion like Methodism or, you know, uh, you were Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever, you know, in one of the mainline traditions, they're not talking about that traditional form of worship. They're talking about outside it. It is more of a revolt pushing against that. And we talked about that. That started in the 60s, where the young adults were pushing back, you know, with the Vietnam War, pushing it back against the church for the churches was too entangled with, with the government. And they were pressing on that. It's like you're, 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 in, you're, you're too attached to it, and there's an alliance there, and we don't like it. So this is kind of a, a, a pushback on that. You see this happening, and it went on. And uh, it, it was a powerful, powerful time and things. Freak here means enthusiast, and also, though through the term of originally used by outsiders, this Jesus freak, believers in the movement adopted it as their own. So it was meant to be a slam in the beginning, but eventually they just took it on and said, yeah, I'm a freak for Jesus. I'm a Jesus freak. And it kind of took hold and it kind of took root and they took off with that. Um, the Jesus movement was a revival of sorts, if you want to call it that, in the late 60s, early 70s, and it started am among the counterculturists of the West Coast. It's really where it stayed, the San Francisco area, all up and down the coast, eventually made itself to Wisconsin and some of the mid-states, and even eventually to the East Coast. But it originated with hippies who were unfulfilled 
with the drug-saturated sexual revolution that was going on at the time. And they found more meaning in Jesus' teachings and, and than they did you know, on love and peace than they did in that culture of doing drugs and sex, drugs, rock and roll. They just, there was a big movement here, and it was a big, big push. The movement was mostly Pentecostal in nature and in emphasizing healing signs and miracles. A lot of that stuff was taking place at the time. So I just want to reflect on the 70s just for a moment. In the 70s, the social progressive values began. They began in the 60s, but they, were, they moved right on into the 70s. We see it today if you're watching the elections, watching any of these debates, regardless if it's a senator or a congressman or the president's, uh, you can hear this language coming out in it, um, such as increasing political awareness and political and economic liberties for women. That, that movement is to continue to grow, this pro-woman, you know, equal rights. The hippie culture was started in the latter half of the 60s, and it, it kind of started to wane and fade a little bit in the 70s, not for me, but it did for some, and faded towards the middle part of the decade, which involved opposition big time for the Vietnam War. There was just a big opposition for it, opposition to nuclear weapons, the advocacy of world peace, the hostility to the authority of the government and big business. This is what, that, that, this is what they were pushing against. And then, and then, of course, the environmental movement had began already in a, in, a dramatic, in, a, in a dramatic way at that time. It just pushed forward heavily. Some of the highlights of the 70s, some of you will remember this, 1972, 11 Israeli Olympians were killed in a terrorist attack. Do you remember that back in 1972? That was a big deal. Richard Nixon becomes the only president of the United States to ever resign from his position. Despite several apparent violations, the Soviet Union beat the U.S. to win the gold medal of the 1972 Munich Olympics, ending the American 63-game winning streak. And so the Russians have been messing with us for a long time, haven't they? You know, they were, they were still at it back then. The 73 Triple Crown winner secretary is considered by many the greatest racehorse of all time. And if, you, if you're a Derby fan or any of that, you watch that, they still talk about secretariat. April 1973, FedEx opened its doors. And in 1974, one of my heroes in baseball, Hank Aaron, hit his 715th career home run, surpassing Babe Ruth on the all-time list. I remember, like I said, Hammer and Hank. And, you know, Hammer and Hank. And the first airbag was fitted to some GM cars in 1974. Anybody own a airbag in 1974. I didn't. And in 1977, this movie came out that really changed a lot for a lot of people. Star Wars. It was a big deal. You know, Star Wars. It features a Wookiee and a Jedi and a good-looking Harrison Ford. And we all witnessed, but you, when you watch that show, if you watch the, the whole thing with Star Wars, you see a, a, a biblical narrative going on. It, it's, it's good versus evil, right? You got the force. The force be with you. It's really talking about the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit be with you. May the Spirit of God be with you. And then you have the dark side, which you could easily parallel with the principalities and powers of Satan. Uh, and that's what you see all through this force, is the force against the dark side. Um, so a lot of parallels. You can see God in popular culture in that movie, no doubt about it. You had the hit song, Staying Alive, written by the Bee Gees. You know, the Bee Gees were big back then. Disco. Disco Inferno. All right. And then the 1979, Sally Field denies Jane Fonda for back-to-back -back Oscars with her starring role in the movie Norma Ray, which was a great movie. Then there was a variety of music in the 70s. I mean, a variety of music, more than ever before in any generation. Music listeners had dozens of genres to choose from, and many of them rose to popularity in different points during the decade. Finding God in popular culture in the 1970s was easy, you could find, especially with the Jesus movement going on in the age of the rock operas with Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar and Tommy and Hare. These were all big-time big time at that time, and I've already told you the, the meaning of God's spell, but the hair, the, 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 the rock opera hair, it tells a story about a tribe. It's about a tribe of people, a coalition. Uh, they're politi politically active. They're long-haired hippies. It's the age of Aquarius, which is one of the big songs in, in that rock opera, living a bohemian life in New York City and fighting against conscription into the Vietnam War. So again, it's still a rebellion. It's a push against that. A uh, friend of mine that Michael knows, uh, Doug, Doug uh, lives out in California, but Doug, not, he wasn't in the opera itself, but when the opera went to Broadway and it went on the North American tour, our buddy Doug was the lead singer in Hair for four years around the world. So he has a lot of fascinating stories to talk about at that time. Then you had Tommy, which features The Who. I mean, if you're a Who fan, you would know this. The album was mostly composed by guitarist Peter Townsend and his rock opera that tells the story of Tommy Walker, a deaf, dumb, blind boy 
including the experiences with his life and his relationship with his family, but still a spiritual undertone with that whole movie and that whole rock opera. And then, of course, you had Jesus Christ Superstar, which was one of my all-time favorites. You could play it. I could sing it backwards and forwards you today. Um, at Easter time two years ago on Fox, um, they, they redid this. They recasted it. They did it live, and they replayed it last year on Easter. If you haven't seen the new one, it's, it's really, really, really good. It's got Johnny Legend playing Jesus. Alice Cooper plays Herod. I mean, come on, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, it was, it's awesome. And uh, the music was written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and the lyrics by Tim Rice. And it depicts the political and interpersonal struggles between Judas Iscariot and Jesus. Not that they're biblical, and they're, that's not present in the Bible, but, but that's the depiction. It's, a, it's this free interpretation of Jesus' dialogue. And, and it's, a politi- it's all by this movement that we're talking about. So it's Jesus having this dialogue with Judas through the whole rock opera. And it's just fantastic. And the movie is incredible. And, uh, it, it, but it wasn't just the rock operas that you could experience God in popular culture. You could also find it all day long in secular music. I could play all kinds of songs and give you all kinds of clips of movies showing God in popular culture at that time. But we're going to take a look at one. Um, and just to give you my, uh, just to prove my point, this is a song that this band performs on an old show that I used to stay up late. I couldn't wait till it come on. It was a midnight special. Anybody old enough to remember the midnight special with Wolfman Jack? Hey, man, it's Wolfman Jack, you know? I loved that show. And then you, had the, then you had Don Kirsch's Rock Concert was another one. That was another way he stayed up. But this band played on the Midnight Special. This is a big hit for them. Um, and uh, they're still together today, uh, at least most of them. They still tour around. I saw them at the Vail Prophet Fair a few years ago. But then, I'm going to go ahead and just play the whole song. But this is their song. This was not a religious song. This was not a tradition. It wasn't a, a Christian song. It was a secular song. came out to the secular radio waves. Uh, but this is it, and it's from the Doobie Brothers. It's called Jesus Is All Right With Me, but check it out. And this is what it looked like back in the 70s, so it's perfect for this, this show. Hello, pod listeners. Due to copyright restrictions, the praise videos, any music, any video illustrations that were used during this service are excluded from this final recording. You can find the links to these videos or illustrations in the show notes. We apologize for any inconvenience. Thanks again. Yeah! Doobie Brothers. I've already ordered on Amazon one of those hats for John, the bass player, and Mark. I got one of them big white things. I don't know even what you call it, but I got one. They'll have those on next week. But, uh, <laughs> but that was, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm just telling you, this movement was huge, and it, it influenced everything uh, at that time. It was a big, big, big movement, this Jesus movement that took place. Uh, being hippie was cool. Here's a picture of me in 1970s. This is what I look like. Nope, nope, back, back. Go back. There you go. That, that's me in the 1970s. So that's validation. I was a hippie, you know. And I wasn't no Jesus freak at that time, I can promise you. I was far from knowing Jesus at that point in my life. But, but that's what was going on in the 70s. Jesus freaks then were the hippies. They were druggies, they were bikers, and others who combined aspects of their old lifestyle like communal living and modern music with their Christian faith. And so you've seen a lot of this communal stuff. Some of you might remember the show Billy Jack. You know, that was a big thing back in the day. You know, that was a great great line in there where he says, I'm going to take this, my foot, and put it on the left-hand side of your face, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, I love that line in that movie. But that was, but they were communal living. They They were really living out this movement that we're talking about in a big, big way. Uh, the Jesus movement was influential in bringing fresh music to traditional churches, as well as the development of the Calvary Chapel and Vineyard churches, but for the most part, died out in the 80s. But it was huge. And why we do tra- traditional music today in, a, in, in, a, in our contemporary music today in a traditional setting came out of this setting. I mean, all the praise bands that would follow, the ones that you listen to today that are popular, all were influenced by this movement of bringing this type of music and breaking the cycle of just the old traditional hymns and the classic hymns. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just saying they brought it because this is what the people wanted. This is what the young generation wanted. They wanted this new folk and kind of uh, contemporary style music to come. And it did, and they poured it in in a big way. But this movement was huge. I mean, if you saw some of these gatherings, it looked like Woodstock. Thousands of people giving their life to Christ in this movement. So this little clip we're going to watch just for a minute. This shows you what that was like back in the early 70s. This is out in California at Calvary Chapel, and this is one of their ocean baptisms, and look how many people were involved in it. 
Hello, pod listeners. Due to copyright restrictions, the praise videos, any music, any video illustrations that were used during this service are excluded from this final recording. You can find the links to these videos or illustrations in the show notes. We apologize for any convenience. Thanks again. So you can see how big a deal. I mean, that's just one little segment of it, but it was a huge movement and it influenced the world. It influenced all kinds of pop culture, music, everything alike. The term Jesus Freak is still used today in a lesser degree. It's also a popular song. Bill was pointing it out to me when we come in from the Christian group DC Talk. And the title of their book on Christian martyrs called Jesus Freak, it's also the album. And they popularized the term in 1995 to be a, be a popular term. Jesus Freak became kind of just part of vogue in, in the language of that day. If you have your lesson plans with you, you know, this is where you might want to pull them out. And we're going to uh, really unpack the scripture that Jane read so eloquently for us today as we look at Matthew 16. But what is the Jesus Freak? What is the definition of it today? And, and then in, in this first slide... In modern times, a Jesus freak is anyone who's an enthusiast, enthusiastic about following Jesus and is not afraid to show it. So that's the definition. And so if we go back to that game again, that let's pretend game we started with, and you change it around to where the reporter's defining a Jesus freak with this definition, does it change how you would answer the question, or if, especially live on TV? If, it, if this is what it meant, it means you're enthusiastic about following Jesus and you're not afraid to show it. That's, a, that's the definition really in today's time and culture. But I want, to hear, I want you to hear, I'm going to read something from Luke 9, 26. I want you to hear what Jesus has to say. And as kingdom people, I think it's really, really important to hear what Jesus has to say about what it's going to mean for you in your future. It says, so let's look at Luke 9, 26. It says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. So listen to what Jesus is saying. He says, if you're ashamed of me in this life, I'm going to be ashamed of you in the next life. I mean, that's really heavy words, but there's a lot of meat on the bone on that, and you really got to pay attention to it. It puts a twist on it. So here's the challenge for all of us. If you have your tendency to live your life with no real evidence that you're a believer and committed to the kingdom way of living, you might want to take a serious look at this definition and what it means for your life. Meaning if your life and the way you live looks pretty much like everyone else's in the world, and everyone else, especially in the secular world, then what does that really reveal about you personally? If your life just looks like everybody else's, because that's not what your life should look like in the kingdom. When you meet Jesus, and everyone will meet Jesus, friends, Believers and non-believers are like, we'll all meet Jesus. And what's your response going to be if Jesus would say to you, why were you ashamed of me in my words? If, you, if Jesus asked you that question, why were you? Why were you ashamed of me in my words? Why did you live your life trying to fit into the world system as opposed to living the kingdom life? And these are hard but serious questions that all of us must wrestle with if we decide we're going to live out the rest of our life on, on how we're going to live the rest of our life on this planet. Are we going to live this worldly life and continue to go on where I'm only looking out for number one? Or am I going to really try to live a kingdom life to help usher in the kingdom of God? Really, really important questions. You know, Jane read for us Matthew 16, 21 through 26. And of course, Jesus is predicting his death, but he's a whole lot more in there because he's telling us what it, what it means to be a Jesus freak, ultimately, what it means to be a kingdom person. And right away when Peter challenges him on what he's saying, he knows that he's being influenced by Satan, by he's being influenced by the devil. And he says right away, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. And then he goes on to say this. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. That's all you care about. And so Jesus is revealing what spiritual warfare looks like. Not only did he experience it, but all of us experience this kind of Jesus, this, this warfare in our life. So you ask yourself a question. What's the validity test? What's the acid test to this? What are you most concerned about? What do you think about most? Are you more concerned about the election? Your 401k, where you live, what you dry, or what you're going to wear? Or are you more concerned with people that don't have anything to eat? The homeless, the poor people that are struggling in life, the down and out, the people that are sick, the marginalized, the thirsty, the oppressed, going down the line, the addicts, the alcoholics, people that are just really behind the eight ball in life. What are you most concerned with? The evidence will show you. 
What do you think about most? And this is what Jesus is trying to tell us in a hard way, what it means to be that. So this next slide tells us what it means to be a disciple. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And so the million dollar question is to you and to me, do I want to be Jesus' disciple? Or do I just want to live for myself and get the most out of this world? But this is what Jesus is saying, that this is what it's going to take. You're going to have to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. And that, man, that's, that's Jesus stating some tough stuff there. When you surrender your life and your heart to Christ, you're saved. Amen. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about it. We, we sang that in many songs this morning. You're saved. But Jesus gives you back your life and now asks you to go give it up for other people so they can be saved too. So it's not just what he saved your life, but not just for you, not for your own self to go live for yourself, but to go out and be a maximum service to God in the world and help bring others along with you. And that's the message. And so are you doing that in some capacity, in your own way, with your own gifts and your own talents? I don't know. But that's something that you all have to be accountable for and we need to think about. Jesus goes on to say this, <clears throat> for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. I mean, this is pretty direct stuff. And I hear it all, I've heard it all the times. I've said it myself. Man, I'm going to go move somewhere else where nobody knows who I am. I'm going to start over. I've heard people walk away from their relationships. I want to get away from this. I want to go here. I want to go do this. I want to go find myself. And if you would say that to Jesus, Jesus would say this to you. It isn't about finding yourself. It's about losing yourself. The problem is you're too invested in you. You want to be free? You want to be happy? You want to be joyous? You want to really be free? Go get invested in other people. And that's a hard shift if you're living this life. And the world breeds this type of thing. There's a lot of mystery and magic and spiritual reward beyond our wildest imagination. But it, to experience it, you've got to surrender. But you have say-so. You have free will. Call it the greatest, gift, the greatest curse or the greatest gift. You can call it whatever you want, but you have it. you got to walk out of here and do whatever you want in your life. You have say-so. God gave it to you. But... What are you going to do with it? I mean, at the end of the day. And so that's where we're left with. And, there, and by the way, let me just make this claim, that there's another word that's synonymous with Jesus freak in today's culture, and it's called Christian. Just being a Christian is pretty synonymous with being a Jesus freak. You may not seem like it, and maybe in your little tight circles, but you get outside these circles and go into the real world, go in and go out and press around where most people live, and you'll get pushback for having that name or even bringing the subject up. You know, you'll get plenty of pushback. Kids that are going off to college face it every day. That's why most kids, unfortunately, drop their faith as soon as they hit the college campus because they can't handle the pushback. When people start saying, what about evolution? And what about this? And how come he hasn't showed up in 2,000 years? And blah, blah, blah. And they have no response to any of those questions. They just drop their face like a hot rock and walk on. That's what I'm talking about. It's that definition. And it's, and it's really, really hard out there sometimes. But listen, this is what Jesus says. Go on to this last slide. For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Not what they intended to do, what they thought about doing, they were hoping to do. No, it's all going to be about what you've done with your life. And you've got to say so to what you do. So the good news is, the hope is, it's never too late to change. It's never too late to start doing something different in your life. And so what does it really mean to be a Jesus freak? What is... What is being a Jesus freak or even a Christian look like in today's culture. And this last slide really points it out. Go on to the next one. There you go. It's, these, it's really these five things. What does a Jesus freak look like? They love God with their entire being. They love their neighbor as themselves. When they go out into the dark world, they're easy to find them because they, they carry such a bright light. I mean, they stick out like a sore thumb. You can tell a Jesus freak by the fruit they produce. And they live for righteousness, justice, and peace. That's the kingdom calling. And that's what a Jesus freak looks like. And so if I'm living a spiritual life, this is what it should look like. And if I'm not, then, then the hope is that you make some decisions to change some things. I hope if you ever meet that reporter, that that would ever happen to you. That you can ask if you're, they ask you if you're a Jesus freak. I hope that you've got a contagious smile that wraps all the way around your head, and you can say, you bet I am. 
Not only am I hope you are too, and I hope everybody listening is a Jesus freak too. I hope they all come to know the Lord. I hope that's what all of us would say in that situation. And it's only by the grace of God, by the cross, by the resurrection that I can even stand here today and say that. I mean, that's what we want to be able to, to testify to the world. Remember saying, the day is coming either in this lifetime or the next, but you will stand in front of Jesus and his angels, as it was pointed out. And here's what you want to hear from his lips. You want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in to paradise. That's what you want to hear. Well done. You didn't do it perfectly, but your heart was right and you were committed and it is validated. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're feeling convicted by this, then I'm not sorry for that. I just encourage you to think about what this message is really saying to you and remember that in the 21st century, it's no longer called a Jesus freak. It's just being a Christian. But I hope you do become a Jesus freak. So when that question is, am I a Jesus freak? I hope you can say with an affirmative, you bet I am. All the way down. And, uh, and I'm working on I'm a work in progress, each and every one of us. So this time I'm going to invite the band back up. It's a challenging message to hear. But this is what a movement looks like. There's a lot of people in the world that say we need another movement right now. The world's in a dark place. It's heavily divided. We need a spiritual awakening in a big way. We need a revelation. We need something to happen. Maybe we need another movement. We know a movement's going to come when Jesus comes back, amen? amen? But as kingdom people, we're supposed to be that movement right now, right this way. What does it all look like? It's an ever-changing world. It's a dark world. But this culture shift that I'm talking about, we've been talking about for several weeks, hopefully it helps you resonate why we're in the position that we're in today in this world and why it's changed so much, especially in the last 50 years. It's changed a lot, and it's going to continue to change. But that doesn't give us an excuse to stop trying to advance the kingdom, amen? It's our job. So we just got to be kingdom people and sold out for Christ. And, and, uh, and it isn't about labels. It isn't because I got a Christian bumper sticker on my car. I got some labels here. Or I'm wearing Christian attire that validates that I'm a believer. It's all those things that I pointed out. How you live your life. How do you treat other people? I mean, that's what it boils down to. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for your message. And we know it's not easy to hear. To pick up our cross and follow you is not easy for anybody. But yet that's what you're asking us. You gave up your life on the cross to save our life. And then in return, you're giving us back our life and you're asking us to give it up for somebody else. And we struggle, Lord. We struggle with this thing of just self, this, this, this entitlement to ourself, this, this, this constant urge to just do what we want, the way we want, how we want. And Lord, we just pray whatever obstacles in our way, whatever thing that's any bondage that's holding us back from really being a true disciple, truly living out the kingdom calling, Lord, we pray boldly that you remove it from our lives. Help us with the power of the Holy Spirit to have the willingness to live the kingdom life, to truly be the people you've created us to be, to use our gifts, our talents, and our treasure the way that you've asked us to in a bold and mighty way. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, where you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and our, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www. 
hilltran.org for more information and to give. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Hey, thanks for being a member of this extended church family. I'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of God.